What do we have in the inbox today? Yeah, we got a good one that just came in uh, from a scientist. Um, they're doing protein and peptide analysis. Okay. And they're concerned about nonspecific binding. And in particular, they're asking if you need to worry about that if you're using high concentrations of sample. We know it's a problem when you're using low concentrations, mm. but they're specifically calling out, is it a problem if you're doing high concentrations? That's a really great question. I mean, we know that peptides and proteins, they suffer from nonspecific binding, right? Yeah. They'll stick to anything, and especially, you know, they'll stick to the sample containers that they're in. Yep. We know that if, you know, they're challenged and trying to reach very low levels of detection, um, they'll often try to concentrate these samples and they'll do anything they can to avoid sample losses. So we know that at low levels, the sample loss is very apparent. Yeah. But yeah, it's a good question. At higher concentrations of sample, even if you lose a little bit, you know, does, does it matter? Yeah, I've read in some papers where people try to like get around this by either injecting um, large concentrations of a different protein, um, maybe even using like some sort of a surfactant. I mean, yeah. I doubt a peg because that probably gets all fouled up in your MS, but again, some sort of surfactant to try to minimize these types of interactions. I think we can do some myth busting here. I think so too. I think we can design an experiment that will look at a range of peptides. Okay. And I think we should look at those surfactants and carrier proteins yep. that people will use just to reduce nonspecific binding and yeah. see if there's any effect from those. I think we can look at a variety of sample containers yeah. and see what the choice of sample container has on nonspecific binding losses. And to specifically address this question, let's look at varying concentrations. We can look at something at a low concentration, like one nanogram per mil, and yep. maybe a hundred nanogram per mil. Sounds see great. If, if there's a difference, if there's any impact. Yeah, yeah, because it comes back to the concentration. You know, if you're not sample limited and you're injecting large volumes, do you really need anything? Ah, let's do it. Let's do it. So Kim, we ran some experiments. And what I had done here is that I took um, a clean eluent and I spiked in some protein and even a surfactant just to see how the background kind of changes or looks um, after that's done. And from these four kind of scans, you can see with no blocking agent, eh, not much in there. Looks pretty clean. Right, looks clean. That's what you want. Now, but when you start doping stuff in there like BSA or rat plasma or um, polyethylene glycol, Boy, you start to see a bunch of these kind of funky um, extra peaks. Oh, that, that is not good because usually when you're doing this type of analysis, you're trying to concentrate your sample and really see these low levels, right? And if you add these things in, you're, you're definitely adding extra things to your chromatography exactly and right. to your mass spec. Why would you want to be adding gunk to your sample run? And that's what you're doing. So we also took a look at four different peptides and we wanted to look at a variety of sample containers because okay. that's a really easy way to take a look at the effect of nonspecific binding. So we took a look at some containers that are designed with optimum surfaces to reduce nonspecific binding. We looked at some glass vials, silanized. We looked at an LCMS certified glass vial and then a standard polypropylene plate and a standard polypropylene vial that people would typically use. Yeah. And you can see the results really vary depending wow. on the peptide. So like desmopressin, that's a very well behaving peptide. And it shows up fine with, you know, 100% recovery no matter what container you use. Yep. But if you look at some of the other peptides, you can see how nonspecific binding actually really comes into play. And with some of the glass vials and the standard polypropylene vials, we can't even really see those peptides anymore. Yeah. So in that case, you really do need to choose a container that has a surface that's been optimized to reduce nonspecific binding. That's great. Now, did you add anything to this? Did you add a carrier protein or did you add? Not in this case. We just wanted to see the pure effect of the container on nonspecific cool. binding. Now, JT, to really address this scientist's question, it was important to look at different concentrations of peptide. Yep. So we look at one nanogram per mil of glucagon and we put that in a container that's been optimized to reduce nonspecific binding, and then just a standard polypropylene container. 
and you can see that with the optimized container, we actually get an 11 time increase in signal wow. for that one nanogram per mil of glucagon. Yeah, and that's at a low, real low concentration. Right, and that's that's where our scientists expected they would have to worry about it. Yeah. But what's more you know, remarkable here is that even in a high concentration, we're looking at 100 nanograms per mil of bovine insulin, and we can see that if we look at the container that's been optimized to reduce nonspecific binding versus, again, a standard polypropylene container, we still see a two-time increase in signal here. Um, so even at the higher concentrations, you've got to think about nonspecific binding because all of that's going to lead to you know, variability, problems, and, and getting reproducible results yeah. that, that you can trust. I mean, you can imagine this would change in how much you lose to nonspecific binding over time as well. So from injection to injection, analysis to analysis, you're going to get variability even at a high concentration. Yeah, an optimized container is definitely key here. Yeah, I think so. So JT, what do you think? I, I think we were able to really show that you know, if you have to add a carrier protein or surfactant, you're yep. adding things to your sample that you may not want to add. I was calling it gunk. Yeah, gunk. <laughs> if you are working at, you know, different concentrations, the sample container that you choose, whether it's optimized to reduce nonspecific binding or not, can have an effect. Yeah, I mean, I thought even when you showed that experiment where we had a really high concentration, it even mattered then. I mean, from one nanogram, all the way up to 100 nanograms per mil. I mean, boy, that's a big spread. Even at the higher concentrations, it mattered. It did, and that's really what our scientist was asking, right? Yeah. Do they have to worry about sample losses and nonspecific binding at high concentrations? They knew that it was a problem at low concentrations, but yeah. I think we'd have data to show them that they have to think about it at high concentrations too. Yeah, I agree. So let's just call this one. What do you, how do you want to call this? I think it is busted. 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 Yeah, so let me write this back up. I'll get back to the customer. Great work as usual. Awesome. And now uh, we'll get on to the next myth. All right, let's All right. go. If you'd like your question to be answered on a future episode, please feel free to email us at trustyourscience at waters.com. <laughs>